This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass until the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Friends, grace and peace to you from God the Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I really got a kick last week out of... So I was preaching about the Beatitudes, right? The very beginning of Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus goes up onto the mountain. It sounds like he's sort of escaping the crowds for a moment. That's going to be important later. And as his disciples gather around, he starts the Beatitudes, which I and many others say are the most important words ever written. Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who mourn, etc. And last week I was comparing the way that we use that word blessed or blessing and the way that Jesus seems to use that same word. And I think that we agreed that we, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. For example, I, I saw something this week and I wanted to bring it up. You will never hear Jesus saying, living my blessed life. It's just not what Jesus means. He, he's blessing people and telling them God draws close to those who are oppressed and sad, whom the world has brought low. Which, if we're being honest, that's where God is truly needed. That's how God works. Can God bless us all the time and is a fancy car some kind of a sign of God's blessing? I don't know, but that's not the point that Jesus is making in that moment. And I got such a kick out of one phrase that I used that seemed to resonate pretty well in here, which is, bless your heart. That's one way that we use that word that might not align exactly with the way that Jesus talks about blessing. I think that we agree that when we hear somebody say, bless your heart, it can mean a lot of different things and most of them aren't Christ-like. <laughs> bless your heart. This morning, I'm gonna call phrases like that Southernisms. And I wanna be careful because I'm not from the South Lots of you are, but we are a very good mix of different folks. Some who were born and raised in the South, many who weren't, but for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit has brought us here together. So I don't want to step on any toes, but I have noticed that there are some words and phrases that you hear, at least at this part of the South, that you didn't hear, for example, where I grew up. And it's kind of important and very helpful to learn a little more about these southernisms so that you can really know what people are saying. And one of them is bless your heart. There's others too though, like if somebody is fixing to do something, they're like preparing to do it, they're going to do it. And folks don't typically turn the lights on or off or turn the car engine on or off, they cut it on or they cut it off. Or as Bonnie, our office manager, told me this week, reminded me of a really good one, is used to could. I didn't hear that growing up, but it's a very useful <laughs> phrase. If anybody ever said to me, Pastor, can you do a backflip on a trampoline? I would say, well, used to could. <laughs> but my favorite Southernism is very, such a simple word, and it's the word y'all. It makes so much sense. I have to tell you, I've used the word y'all a lot, even before I moved to the South, especially in those days and years when I was serving a lot of tables and yes, tending bar. 
because it's really helpful to address a group of folks by saying y'all. It's so much nicer and friendlier than you guys, which you hear a lot, at least where I grew up. And it's a lot less cumbersome than you folks. Y'all, it just makes so much sense. But I'm still learning about y'all. See, I didn't know that you could use the word y'all, but just mean a few people in a larger group. So I could say y'all and mean everybody here in this room and the folks who are joining us online, y'all. But I could also be talking about one specific person, which I wouldn't do during a sermon, but I could, or one family, and say y'all help the church so much. And I'm just maybe for that moment just speaking about that single person or that group. The term y'all can mean a lot of different things, and it's a very simple way to be clear that I'm talking about everyone, and I'm still learning, but there's another phrase, and it's a southernism, and it's for everybody, all of you, and that is all y'all. It even rhymes. It's perfect. All y'all. So I could say y'all, or I could say all y'all. Okay, so has pastor just gone off the deep end or what? But I think it's fun to talk about Southernisms. I hope I'm not offending anyone. These are words and phrases that are very useful if you know how to use them. But what difference does it make? I'm so glad you asked. Because this morning, we hear the continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. And there's actually kind of a lot of debate, scholarly debate, about the Sermon on the Mount that most of us probably don't think about or care that much about. But the central question is, who is Jesus talking to when he's giving the Beatitudes and this further teaching about salt and light and the law and the prophets? There's a central question there. Because again, at the beginning of the chapter, it sounds like Jesus is breaking away. He's going up the mountain just for some breathing room. And soon his disciples are gathered around him. And it says he began to teach them. That's very possible that the crowd sort of followed them up. Right? They wanted more from Jesus. What they had seen and heard was really good stuff. And so the crowd has assembled again. And it's very hard to know exactly who Jesus was talking to. But we hear some language this morning that's very familiar to us, not just biblically, but in our common language too. We hear things like, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And I feel like we all have a shared understanding of what it means if someone is salt of the earth, right? And I'm not sure if it's exactly what Jesus means, but if someone is salt of the earth, I typically think that they are hardworking. They have an integrity about them. I think of someone who's probably straightforward and uncomplicated, and that is all good. You are the salt of the earth. Those are good things to be. And then you are the light of the world. It's pretty self-explanatory. Somebody who shines brightly is a beacon, an inspiration, a positive force in the world. So is that what Jesus is saying? That you, as an individual person, are called to fit into those characteristics in order to be a disciple? That's why it's a central question about who it was that Jesus was actually talking to when he said these things. It can be so easy to say, I need to fit into this certain way of being in order to be the best disciple that I can be. That's what Jesus means when he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And if you've been around church a lot or for a long time, you've probably heard a lot of sermons, maybe even from this very pulpit, about salt and light and say about the properties of salt and light and how in the first century, especially both salt and light were so very valuable. Maybe you learned some interesting facts like a Roman soldier upon his retirement would literally receive his weight in salt as a retirement gift so that he could survive the rest of his days. And that's important. That's all important stuff. But we're going to keep focusing on this question, who was Jesus talking to? Was he talking to you as a disciple? Probably. His innermost circle of disciples, so just them and not the rest of us like everybody else, the gathered crowd. In this case, I think that we ought to care about this question because it helps to reveal a really important aspect of his teaching here. And it begins with simple understand, a simple understanding of simple statements. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. 
And this is why biblical literacy is actually important, why we should all care, because we're missing something if we think that it's all about what characteristics do I have to learn to grow into to be a disciple? We're missing something. I suppose that's why some folks engage in intensive Bible study, and some of us go to seminary so that we can learn about this stuff, because I happen to know that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, the verse that starts, you are the salt of the earth, the word that's translated as you here, and bear with me, is the Greek word humis, and it's not the delicious chickpea stuff that you put on crackers, although that's great. Humis is actually a present participle, second nominative, plural noun. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it's important. Stick with me. That means that the best translation of that word is not you, it is all y'all. Truly, there is no better way to translate that than all y'all are the salt of the earth. All y'all are the light to the world. This is not about individual characteristics that make you something that maybe you weren't born to be, and you have to fit into that in order to make a difference. He is speaking to what would become the church, to say all y'all together. This is what you do together. This is what you can offer the world together. And so it's important that these are both extremely valuable things that we together, all y'all, all of us, can offer to the world. Who is he speaking to in the Sermon on the Mount? All y'all. And by working together with our many varied but shared gifts, we can feed the world and be a light to the world, as Jesus calls us to be. Our Lutheran tradition speaks beautifully about this. I was reminded in a great conversation this week about the importance of the priesthood of all believers. That means that not any one of us has access to God that others don't, not even by fitting into some moral category or always doing the right thing or fitting into certain characteristics. We all share access to God and offer it to the world in the gifts that God has given to you. But it's not till we come together and start to feed the world together and to proclaim the goodness of God and Christ together to a desperate world that we're actually living into the discipleship that Jesus calls for in the Sermon on the Mount. It's about all of us, all y'all. When our council gathers this coming weekend for our annual retreat, we are gonna begin to lay a foundation for the visions and goals of this congregation, all y'all for the coming year and the next several years. And I can guarantee you that there won't be any goals that any of us can achieve alone. There will be zero goals that say, well, the chair of such and such a team, this one's on you. No, they're gonna be goals that we can live into and, and, and live together so that we can be the best because it's about us. It's not about you and your righteousness. The same thing, by the way, goes in verses 19 and 20 when he said, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, which is a pretty high bar, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What he's really saying is, unless all y'all can do something other than follow the book by, by the letter, unless you can do something that's more inspirational for the world together, then the kingdom of heaven won't be present here among you. It's a call for all of us to share. And as we set these goals in the council, share them around the congregation, work toward the, those goals, they really will only be successful if each and every one of us gives 100% and does whatever we can to make the all y'all work. Because it's gonna take all of us, not calling a new deacon, or the preaching of the pastor, or the work of the youth group, those are all great things, but it's gonna take all of it together, and all y'all doing these things together to inspire our community and the world. We're not gonna set these goals so that our church won't die. We're not gonna set these goals and meet them so that the church will grow. I know that sounds weird, but that's not why we're doing this. We will do this work together, all of us together, because the world is desperate for the gospel good news of salvation in Christ. 
And so, because of this, throughout these processes, all of us together will be making plans that are spirit-driven and that lean truly into the all y'all of the call of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen.